had a negative test. Good afternoon, everyone, or if it's morning or evening or some other time, wherever you are, good that as well. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute. Welcome to the second in our three part series of events around the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission dam safety regulations. The first update in a very long time, and we are excited to bring you more content about these changes. The first panel or the first event you will remember last month in March had FERC representatives followed by a Q&A session. Today we bring you the consultants there preparations, their adaptations to the new dam safety regulations. If you do not know anything about the GEO Institute, it's probably a good time for you to learn something. Head on over to geoinstitute.org. Don't mind the military aircraft flying over me right now. <laughs> we are a membership society comprised mostly of geotechnical engineers and or geologists. We have about 12,000 members. We are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should do a couple of things. You should click subscribe, you should click get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. One more housekeeping note before I kick you over to our MC for today, and that is if you have a question for our panelists, please put it in the chat box to the right of the window that you are watching this in and we will relay that to them. So let's get started. Moderator for our panel today from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. You know him, you love him. It's Tim Stark. Tim, take it away. Thanks, Brad, for that generous introduction. Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce our four distinguished panelists for our second in our three-part series on the new FERC regulations in alphabetical order. First is Dr. Craig Finley. He has been in private dam safety consulting practice as Finley Engineering Inc. since 1998 and has practiced civil slash geotechnical engineering for over 45 years with th over 36 years of experience in dam engineering. He is a life member of ASCE and he worked on the ASC Energy Division's task committees charged with drafting the guidelines for instrumentation and measurements for monitoring dam performance in 2000 and its sex successor, monitoring dam performance in 2018. He is the chair for the ASDSO's boards of advisory board in 2021 and 22 and a past editor of the ASDSO Dam Safety Journal for several years. So Craig, thanks so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Great, next up is Dave Paul. Dave is a managing partner of Paul Geotech Engineering LLC based in Denver. He's retired from the US Army Corps of Engineers in 2018 after 42 years of federal service as the dam safety officer for the Mosul Dam Task Force, which mitigated dam safety issues associated with Mosul Dam. He's also served as a special assistant for dam safety at the Corps of Engineers headquarters in Washington. He's been responsible for managing the Corps portfolio of 715 dams. Prior to his work with the Corps, he worked on dams for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, of course, also based in Denver. So Dave, thanks for joining us and good to see you again. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Thank you. Next up is Del Shannon. He is principal and senior vice president for Schnabel Engineering's Dams and Levees Group. He's, he has over 30 years of experience working in the civil, geotechnical, and environmental engineering fields. With most of this experience working on the design, construction, and safety of dams and levees. Dell's work has been recognized nationally multiple times with the U.S. Society on Dams 20. 07 Award of Excellence in the Construction Project, and he is the current president of USSD, and he's in San Diego attending the current conf USSD conference. So, Dell, thanks for joining us from San Diego. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up is Lee Wooten, who is a principal and a practicing civil engineering at GEI Consultants in Woburn, Massachusetts, with an em emphasis and focus on geotechnical and dam engineering. He has managed and designed multiple rehabilitation dam projects, two of which have received the ASDSO National Awards in 1992 and 2009. He has served with 
and led reconnaissance teams for the GEAR Group Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance and ASCE following Hurricanes Katrina, Gustav, Sandy, Harvey, and Florence. Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Okay, so while the questions are rolling in, I have a couple to get us started today. The first question is, one of the biggest challenges in the new FERC regulations seems to be the change in the requirements for periodic inspection versus comprehensive assessment. A couple questions to the panelists. What is the risk associated with conducting a comprehensive assessment or a CA? And does the engineer become the engineer of record after a CA? So, why don't we just start in alphabetical order? Craig, why don't you start and we'll go around the room and you don't have to comment on them or, or if you want to, please do. <laughs> okay, that was uh, uh, something that I had thought of at uh, one point is that potentially if you go into great depth of review and depending on how the FERC has a sign off on these things, um, do we become the new engineer of record? Uh, and th and that's just a kind of a thought. Um, I don't know. I suppose that we can get enough couch words in there to try to try to get around that. But if something goes wrong, you know, you're going to be the first people to come back. You know, the probably all the designers of the dam are long past. If we've got a hundred year old, fifty year old dam and uh, just need to do a, a thorough job and make sure that uh, we can defend what we did. Dave? Yes, um, I'm personally um, thinking it's similar to performing engineering services and evaluations uh, for owners. I, uh, again, my career has been with the federal government, so we've always had responsibility as the owner. So I, I guess I, I would say I'm somewhat biased that if you're the owner of the dam, then ultimately you have that responsibility as the owner. So um, I, I'm not sure I see uh, where there's an actual transfer, if you will, uh, of liability. Okay, Dale? Well, first of all, there's 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 no such thing as as no liability on on anything you do. Um, uh, there's some really creative uh, lawyers out there that can t try to tie you to everything. That being said, um, I don't think the risk is high. Uh, inspections uh, are performed at a, in all sorts of agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, um, of of which FERC is one, and you know, the Bureau of Reclamation has a has a program like this. Uh, so. I, I, I think the risks are low as compared to the 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 actual designer, the the individual that stamped and sealed the plans and specifications and and so forth. So we're performing a service on behalf of of uh, the regulator. Um, they simply do not have the manpower to to hire and 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 uh, discharge uh, all the engineers needed for this. So they, they have to turn to the consultants. So the risk is um, low, um, and I'd probably consider it fairly low. Um, we're, we're just doing work on behalf of FERC and pointing out issues. Uh, if we find something, we'll dig into it deeper. Uh, but that's my view of it. Okay. Lee? Uh, I tend to agree with everybody, um, but I would point out that the language and the guidelines is they're looking for a lot more out of well it sounds like a lot more out of the uh comprehensive assessments um you know if, if i say it quoted here it says the ic team must use their judgment to determine an appropriate level of independent calculations to be provided for each analysis of record the independent calculations must justify the ic's conclusion as to whether the existing calculations analyses are acceptable um so that's a that's pretty open-ended um and in the past we have typically looked at things reviewed them looked at inputs looked at methods and said okay well this is a little bit beyond that they, they want some calculations now and um they have included a table a table 11 in uh, chapter 16 
which gives examples. I think people are going to really latch onto that table and say, okay, for, you know, it's, it's unreasonable to redo everything. H and H calculations are tremendously involved. You know, if somebody's got finite element stuff, it's a lot of work. Uh, if you're doing um, uh, slope stability analyses, a little bit less work, but still it's not a trivial task. So um, we're going to have to make those analyses. Now, the liability exists, obviously, if a, something bad happens. And the whole point of the part 12 is to identify the problems. And so the new process does uh, in, uh, help the owner, FERC, and the IC team to try to identify those problems. And uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, in the end, FERC has to accept that, that uh, inspection too. So if you're not meeting that standard to some degree, they should be there to control the fact that maybe you haven't done the level of investigation that you should. So it, it is, it, there's a, it's a process that's well defined. If you follow the process, your liability should be limited, but if something bad happens, you could obviously find your name at the end of the lawsuit. Okay. So if I if I could add to that, Tim, sorry if I can jump in. So so one of the kind of the context for some of this stuff is is at Wanapum, um, they found that the calculations were were actually <clears throat> inaccurate uh, for the to deal with the crack and 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 they, and they found some issues with the original calculations. Some similar things happened at Oroville when uh, when they they thought they had grounded these uh, anchors underneath the. the spillway into into competent rock and it would turned out it was just sapper lights and, and, and really incompetent rocks um so so there is some context i guess for that and, and why they want to dig into the calculations a little bit um again it's just to try to get an answer i lee i, I agree with you absolutely we're, we're we're going into a direction that that um it's kind of uncharted territory actually uh to, to do this level of work and it'll be it'll be interesting to see the outcome i uh, i think all of these opinions are valid that that we we, we don't know, actually. Uh, we, we think we know. We have an idea, but we don't actually know. So, Yeah, and I think it's important that we not fool ourselves to think that this is going to cover everything because, you know, still things are going to come to light, which we've totally missed. It's a lot like when you're drilling uh, borings to investigate a site, what's going on in between? You don't know. The The amount of uh, time that you have or the amount of resources that you have to do one of these you know CAs is you know it's not going to be like you're going through design again it's just not the same level of dealing with the problem so it's there is a certain amount of you know we're reacting to some bad things that happened and I'm not convinced myself that this is going to necessarily you know, identify everything. You may identify a few things, but there's you're going to have a lot of gaps that you're not going to see. So I don't think anybody should fool themselves about that. Okay. All right. Next question. In in the revision, the definition of dam failure changed, so it's no longer a release of the reservoir. So and and prior. If it was not a release of the reservoir, it was called an incident, a dam incident. So now it, a failure can involve an incident that does not release the reservoir. So that brings up some interesting questions. Why the change in the definition, do you think? And second, well, I'll start with that. And then I have some hypothetical or scenarios that I'll give to all of you and see whether you classify these as failures or incidents. So, uh, Craig, why don't you start? We'll go around again. Um, could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. I apologize. The, the change in definition for fail, dam failure. No longer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's I think it's a really good idea. It's like when we started out doing the risk assessment or the the uh, failure modes analyses. Um, 
failure was defined as losing your reservoir basically and, and what happens downstream but as uh, we saw in Orville things happen that weren't good that we had to deal with that uh, you know you had to evacuate number of people downstream and there was a lot going on so there are other definitions of failure or undesirable outcomes so I think that's you know important to expand that definition. I, I have no, I, I totally agree with that. Okay, Dave. Um, I, I also uh, agree with, with Craig. Um, again, certainly my experience is biased uh, to the federal world, uh, the Bureau and the Corps. Certainly those guidelines that were developed were originally based on and still are based on on release of the reservoir as as failure and um, you know as the process and the application and the use of risk analysis for risk informed decision making it's it's matured over the last 30 plus years as it's been implemented around the world so i uh, worked on Mosul Dam in Iraq for a number of years uh, on behalf of the uh, U.S. government and the Corps, and uh, it really came home in that project in that the Iraqis' definition of failure was, uh, <laughs> again, any movement. So if there were settlement or some uh, sinkhole collapse or, I mean, their, their frame of reference and their um, definition was much less, if you will, from a from a complete failure. So it really came home to roost as we became involved with Mosul with the government of Iraq. So uh, um, I think that should be the first step of risk analysis is, is the group and the owner along with the regulator needs to set that definition as you proceed. Okay, Dell. Well, um, actually, that's always been my definition of failure is the dam not uh, performing as it was intended to do. So it, it's important, I guess, to, to pull back a little bit. And, and I view dams as a, as a conglomeration of individual structures that, that performs as a system. And all of those individual structures need to be operational and working as planned. So any loss of those uh, individual structures and, and its impact to the overall system is a failure. All right. So a good example of that is is you, you need a proper functioning outlet works, but if you, you can't get your gate open, is that a you know, is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. Absolutely. <laughs> you can't do a, a low level outlet really. So that that's a that's a failure of of the system at an individual component. So I think it's a it's a more broad view of of what we're dealing with in that um, uh, it, it's taking a look at these as more from a system standpoint and and less as an individual structure standpoint. And I think that's a very important and uh, shift in in our thinking of these uh, of these uh, systems. All right, Lee. I, I I sort of agree. i I think life was simpler when we just had it defined as a failure <laughs> of the dam. You know we're here to make sure nobody gets killed downstream. You know, when you're doing that, Life is a little bit simpler. It streamlines the process. And now we're into a, some shades of gray. Um, you know, one of the things they call out are adverse consequence. And they talk about economic, environmental, historical, and recreational. So there are some shades of gray there. You know, it, you got something uh, downstream that somebody thinks is important to them, but all of a sudden, is that a failure mode? I don't know. Um, so we're going to have to doodle that one through. But I think, in general, I think it, it should be primary. Uh, the, the loss of life should be primary. The release of the reservoir should be the things we really emphasize. And OK, let's consider these others. But I, these things are pretty long and costly for the owners to begin with. Um, and I, I don't want to lose sight of what's most important. I, I would just add on to that. It, I'm sure everyone's experiences are likely similar. Uh, again, the Fed world established their tolerable risk guidelines for probability of failure and, and loss of life. So there is that 
set of rules, if you will, from the decision making process. But I think as other owners and utilities, um, I again, as you organize yourself for for a risk analysis for your structure, I think again, defining failure is is important, but also I think the organization needs to evaluate their decision making process and their how, how do they take this information as a that how does the leadership group take this information and make a decision as to whether they're going to make a capital investment for improvements or not so uh, i i think that is needs to be part of the discussion up front yeah and, and let me add on to let me add on to that as well i can't yeah, um Loss of life is is absolutely important, and and there are cases where uh, workers uh, are trying to fix or 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 you know improve something, and they've lost their life in the in that process. There's a case in New York right now where a diver went down to to clean a drain, and it, because it wasn't working properly, the dam wasn't working properly, and he was killed as a result of the improper work of of that. So, I. You know, I, you can make the argument that that that's a safety issue, and that's a that's an issue that needs to be regulated and controlled because someone lost their life. Um, it's not just a dramatic loss of the reservoir, an uncontrolled release, but it was an improper functioning of the dam that caused that that death. And so it's, uh, it's I guess the broader point is you're kind of wading into this gray area again. It's 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 shades of gray that that we're, we're going to start untangling. And uh, yeah. I'll add to that. Okay, so here's some easy ones. An upstream slope failure with no release of the reservoir, a la Lower San Fernando, San Luis Dam, et cetera. So those are kind of easy. But uh, I think, as Dave mentioned, the word failure triggers a lot of things and public reaction when we use the word failure. So let me, uh, Lee, Dell mentioned um, spillway operations, so that's kind of easy. But how about this one? A little muddy seepage on the downstream side. Just a hypothetical. Failure or, or not failure? Just so who, who wants to jump in first? Well, I worked on a project where we had a little muddy seepage on the downstream side that uh, was triggered a board of consultants. So, I mean, we went through and it was a pretty major rehabilitation of the dam. So, you know, that's something that you worry about when you see obviously and uh, it's uh, while not a full failure per se it was actually a failure in process in the pro in the project i was involved in so um one other thing we were one other thing if i could just back way up to the beginning one time um we were talking about risks and uh, one thing i noticed reviewing all of these changed uh, um, regulations that the FERC is implementing is that they have now lumped public safety into our bailiwick, both in the, in the periodic inspection and in the comprehensive inspection. And that's something, I mean, I'm, I'm a one person shop. And so I have to deal very closely with my insurance people and they like to know what I'm doing. And one thing they like me to try to do is avoid third party lawsuits. And if you're looking at uh, public safety now, you know, somebody that should, that's drunk coming down the river and goes over the dam and kills themselves and they want to sue everybody in sight. Now, well, Craig, you know, you were supposed to opine on this public safety and the signs and were the science proper? And I'm not even trained in that, you know. So that's, I guess, something that I'd have to do, and it's something I have to question. Well, as a one one man band, can I do that anymore? So you know, there's all all kinds of things like that. But that's that's a risk I see coming in with these new things. I I you know I understand they want people to look at public safety closer, but in the past that's been done by a separate part of the for coming in on a separate inspection and the, and the owner dealt with them and supplied them with their plan and now they want us to get in on it so i'm not sure i don't feel comfortable with that but that's that's one item i don't know maybe you guys have other items you've seen and that you feel uncomfortable with i, just, no, I agree with you craig i 
it, it, that's a whole nother set of uh, risk and a whole, there are a lot of different considerations, a whole different process from the engineering analyses to looking at recreational users, um, operation of the dam, um, warning for people downstream. We got up, just had it in the news today, uh, a lawsuit for uh, two fellows who were killed downstream of a hydro dam that misoperated um, and put out a big release. And and that is, it is something for FERC to be worried about, but it's, uh, it's a new set of risk for the independent consultants. And I guess uh, to, to answer both your questions, uh, Tim, first of all, uh, or, or both the questions on the table, um, you know, define your scope of work. That's 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 rule number one in consulting. What what are, what are you what are you being hired to do, and what are, what is the limits of your liability in that? So so first of all, uh, if if you're not a public safety officer or or engineer or, or or whatever they call themselves, I don't think you should be doing the work at all. I think you should pull back from that and, and tell the owner, all right, I'm good at this, I'm good at this, I'm really lousy at that. I don't want to. Uh, don't pay me for this. Pay somebody else to do that. Um, to your original question, Tim, about muddy seepage. Um, so you could make the argument at, at Teton that when they saw the, the muddy seepage uh, coming out of the toe there, the dam had failed. The dam, the, and by failure, I mean the complete release of the reservoir. There's nothing that could be done to to arrest that. Uh, that's not the case at every, every structure. Muddy seepage um, could mean that it's... Uh, you know, dozens of reasons, not hundreds, but dozens of other reasons what, of what's going on there. So it it it, it, it depends. Uh, it depends right. on the structure. It depends on the amount of flow. It depends on, on have you seen it before? I mean, it's, I, it's, it's a really loaded question. Um, <laughs> by, the, by the new rules, is the dam per, you know, performing um, as it's intended to? Maybe, maybe not. I, it's, it's, get, get some guys out there and, and take a look and make a call. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, well, you know, back to Teton, I, I would would offer. Yet yeah, they they were monitoring the saturation as the filling progressed, and essentially they predicted, or the uh, geologist predicted that that seepage might express itself in that area about the time that it did. They were monitoring observation wells around the perimeter, so. Um, but at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, I don't think anybody thought that it would uh, progress as rapidly as it did and lead to, to failure. It, uh, that's one item with respect to Teton that uh, a 300 foot high dam unraveled in about five hours is uh, truly a, a remarkable short time frame, I think. Uh, Scary. Case case histories go anyway. So as you said, Dell, it's every case is different and certainly dependent upon geology and engineering and design and construction practices for sure. So yeah. Okay, okay we have a couple a question here from the audience. First, um, does FERC regulate dams related to cooling ponds for gas slash coal-fired power plants or just hydroelectric dams? Just hydroelectric. I think the ash stuff that I've heard, I haven't worked really in the ash stuff. You, you guys probably have, but it seems to be more regulated through the EPA. Yep. Everybody agree? Yep. Yes. EPA? Yep. Okay. All right, good. Uh, so let's keep going. Um, most FERC regulated dams are older, say 50 to 100 years, and have been analyzed and inspected, evaluated numerous times. It seems that most often each new round of study produces some new understanding. Will this evolving process ever stop or plateau? Can a, can a dam or infrastructure element ever be fully understood? No and no. <laughs> okay. Uh, agreed. Yeah, no yeah. one no. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Right. I mean, certainly for the for the older structures, I mean the overall inventory average age in the US is 
60 to 70 years. So certainly a tremendous amount of structures um, are in that category. Um, so fundamental to, to any evaluation is just information. So owners, I think, need to invest in assimilating accumulating all the information associated with that structure and and organizing it so that you can actually evaluate its design and construction and performance as you proceed down this path with with risk uh, informed decision making and risk analysis so yeah Okay, well, that puts into question the the long term or long time statement. I heard it from many people. Uh, if the dam survives first filling, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> Just Sounds throwing good. it out there. Just... <laughs> yeah, that's been overused, I think. <laughs> yeah. Decades, yeah. So. <laughs> I, uh... Then why are we inspecting dams anymore? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to look at both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> well, I think fundamental to any safety program is, again, assimilating your information and then just the periodic frequency of evaluation. So, I mean, if if you are an owner and an operator of a dam, you 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 have significant liability um and and i i'm believing that all owners or most all owners that are in charge of that kind of infrastructure understand that so um certainly could, frequent monitoring and frequent evaluation should be part of any standard operating criteria and operating processes i think Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the counterpoint to the statement is that yes, tea time filled on first filling, but we have a number of failures, uh, most of which did not occur on first filling. Uh, they occurred maybe on the first time a certain load was applied, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Lower San Fernando or the um, ice loading on um, uh, what's the dam and uh, was it Nebraska? Oh, Spencer, 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 Spencer Dam. Um, or the the levees, you know, uh, it, down in New Orleans with Katrina, you know, things. There are loadings out there that maybe weren't considered by the original designers, uh, and structures get old. Uh, things age uh, on structures. So, and it could be. Yeah like the PMF, it's never occurred. And once you have a flood approaching that magnitude of flood, a lot of things can happen differently than you picture that they might have in your analyses or, and, and you know, you can get into trouble that way. Seepage is different. You know, a lot of things can be different. And right. Lee, that's a, that's a really good point, Lee. Uh, but what you're really talking about at first filling is, is the loading of the dam and and uh, the first loading of the dam and so dams don't like high differential loading conditions or they, they like things nice and steady and nice and easy and so you're really uh, on first filling you're you you, you want to make your you don't really know you, you built it to the specs you've built it to the design but you don't actually know until you load it up and you watch it perform how it's going to do so I, that's what we're talking about here is this is the vulnerability of that structure is at its highest on first filling and um you know, from there, it, it, it typically operates pretty steadily. But as with Spencer and ice loading or, or any other unusual you know, earthquake loading or whatever, um, that's the, the, those differential unexpected loading conditions are really hazardous to a, to a dam structure. That's what we're talking about. Right. OK, here's another question from the audience. Uh, under what circumstances, if any, are supplemental geotechnical investigations warranted when performing dam safety inspections? And I think you could put that under a CA. Uh, I'm not sure it goes under a PI, but maybe a CA. Typically, we, we're not going to do investigations like a subsurface investigation as part of a CA or a PI. The outcome of the, of the various PFMA exercises and an identification of risk reduction opportunities very well could be 
that further investigations are warranted to collect data so that you can better understand uh, a particular risk and, and potentially reduce it. Yeah, good. Yeah. I Seconded. echo that. I think that's well said, Lee. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So moving on to the next question. The potential failure mode analysis, or PFMA, can be a powerful tool to leverage expertise of a diverse group of individuals to improve dam safety. And, I, and I, I'm sure you know that they're now recommending teams and so on. However, like any group, a PFMA team can also fall into a group think between members following the leader and not challenging assumptions and different perspectives. Uh, what tools or practices do you recommend such that there's independence and really a thorough look at the PM, oh, sorry, PFMA? I think that starts with getting as many people around the table uh, and, 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 and kind of get away from the smaller groups and get the larger groups, get all the technical experts from, from the individual disciplines. Um, and groupthink is an issue, um, and the groupthink has had pretty, pretty negative consequences to some of these structures. Uh, and um, so I think that's countered by as many different voices as possible from, from a technical perspective. One thing that was kind of, you know, a, a number of things are great about the guidelines, but the guidelines were aware of this, you know, uh, FERC has been through a lot of PFMAs and it's seen group dynamics. They've got a, a little subchapter on group dynamics in guideline 14, and they talk about biases, hysterics, dominant individuals, shy individuals, contrary individuals, sort of the duration of the sessions. So they, they, have highlighted these difficulties and then it the facilitator's role is to be aware of those try to engage everybody and move the process along uh and and make sure people don't get burned out uh, so uh i think FERC is well aware of it and facilitators it's up to the facilitators as much as anybody yeah i agree with that and when you're starting out it's good to explain to everybody that look you know you may not feel comfortable asking a question or you may think it's maybe not an enlightened question, but ask it because it may be, you may trigger us into thinking about something we wouldn't have other, otherwise thought about. And, you know, also uh, another famous thing that we always said at the beginning of these PFMAs was that no hats, you don't represent anybody. You're just here with your knowledge and your ability and, you know, it's it's easy to say that type of thing, but you know that's it's good to frame it ahead of time, just so you can point back and say, "Hey, no hats." <laughs> okay, all right. Um, next question: in a in a PFMA, how do you know you've considered every potential failure mode? What you know? How do you how do you make sure that you've got everything? I think that's part of having a lot of people in the room so you can think of as many different angles as you can. But I mean, there's no guarantee on your, that you're going to think of, think of everything, but you think of as much as you can. And that's one of the reasons we review these every five years to see if we come up with any new failure modes that weren't thought of in the past. So that's a very good question. You know, you can't, you got to realize that you aren't necessarily going to think of everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to yeah, uh, well, go ahead, Lee. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm just going to say, I, I actually think we've, we've, we may be overthinking some of this stuff. I, you know, when, when I started the, the PFMA stuff, we had 30, maybe 40. Um, we're up to in the hundreds now, 120, 100. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's getting a little out of hand, actually. And I, and I think yeah. FERC is, is cognizant of that because you're looking at every situation under every loading condition and each one has its, its own potential failure mode. So I, I think a little, uh, some guardrails are, are needed, uh, actually, in my opinion, but I'll, Lee, you're, you're next. Maybe you disagree with me. So No, I don't. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> although your numbers are a lot more than my experience, I, ha I have seen it. <laughs> I have come across PFMAs that were first done uh, by some of the people who put the guidelines out from the Bureau, and they had three PFMs. 
yeah. you know, for, yeah. for Dam. And typically, I, you know, more than that are usually appropriate. Um, but the process, you, the way that FERC has outlined it, sort of has three ways of trying to catch things. First of all, you have this brainstorming session, which is just a free for all. People throw whatever it, they can think of up against the wall. And uh, so that you try to see if there's something you haven't thought of. After you finish that process, you go back and look at what the previous PFMA came up with. See if there was something that you did not capture. And then finally, in the back of the guidelines, they have a list of common uh, failure mode, potential failure, failure modes that you can refer to. So you, between those three sources, you hope to capture the common ones. But there are, every time something bad happens, we find a new one out. We find out about a new one. The Spencer Dam uh, incident, the Oroville Dam incident, the Folsom Dam incident were all failure modes that I think probably were not touched on by any of the dam uh, PFMAs that were done before those happened. Yeah, that's a real good point. Mm -hmm. I remember at the very beginning when we were doing this, the, uh, the re it's kind of as Dell was saying, the reports were thin, there weren't that many failure modes. And you could hand that report to an operator at the dam and he'd be able to read it and understand it and say, oh, yeah, OK, I'll be looking for that. But now, I mean, some of the worst ones I've seen are pushing 300 pages and as Dell says, hundreds of failure modes that we've subdivided down and that type of thing. Nobody's ever going to read it. No one can read it. I can barely read it myself to review it. So it's like, <laughs> you know, it's it's they kind of they kind of push that into being useful to being damn near not useful <laughs> well but i i think it's a it's the structure of, of risk analysis and pfma and using fundamental potential failure modes is, is extremely powerful it's it's um i think a well established logical thought process for problem solving. Um, I think you certainly going forward, uh, certainly based on experience from the core and the bureau, doing these um, at appropriate level or scaling them for the uh, situation, I think is again, important at the beginning. I think not enough time is spent getting yourself or getting the organization organized uh, up front. Um, they pull out the regs and tell the lead engineer or the chief engineer to go do a risk analysis and, and contracts are put in place and people meet. But I think there needs to be, again, some effort at the beginning to make sure you have your data organized and your rules of engagement and what level of detail you're going to go into. And uh, I, I think that maybe isn't done uh, as much as it should in terms of getting organized for the process. So um, there, there's been thousands of failure mode analysis done. The lists um, are pretty comprehensive. So certainly, as you say, in the brainstorming, that needs to be done up front. I think you can get a pretty well established list related to hydrologic or seismic or seepage and piping that can get get set the framework if you will okay um i'm going to come back to pfma in a minute another question from the audience with the i'm uh, sorry and Dave, this is to you. The USAE ACE manages a portfolio of maybe 500, uh, 700 dams. And I think in your intro, it said 715. How many of those 715 are regulated by FERC? And is there a notable failure of a FERC regulated dam to consider for case history other than Oroville? Uh, well, both uh, the Bureau and the Corps, they're self-regulated. Um, so they, best of my knowledge, they don't uh, have oversight from FERC. So my understanding is FERC is principally, their uh, regulatory responsibility is for private hydro 
operators, utilities principally. So um, certainly uh, within the um, FEMA and the ICODS committees, all the federal agencies that own dams, they meet frequently and um, share experiences and information and, and certainly most of the federal guidelines have input from all the federal uh, dam owners. Um, as far as case histories and failures, I mean, there is quite a few out there. Um, Swift Dam comes to mind up in the Northwest is one. I'm sure there's others that I'm not thinking. Perhaps others can bring up other names. Silver Lake, Silver, Silver Lake, uh, Tom Sock. Uh, Spencer. I, know, I thought Spencer was regulated. Yeah, Spencer, Spencer was. was. Regulated. Um, Folsom, Folsom the, was uh, sort of a hybrid. Yeah. Also, so yeah, yeah a, Folsom, is, failure, Folsom is unique in that it's um, designed and constructed by the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Rec operates it. So that's a, a joint one of those unique ones in the inventory that both federal agencies um, work to uh, um, manage and operate that dam. Okay. The, the, right. The Michigan, the Michigan Dam, sorry, and I, they, uh, FERC washed their hands of it in 2018, and it failed, what, two years later, something like that, three years later, so almost a FERC Dam, but it was, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and I, I, the name escapes me, either, uh, Edenville. E Edenville. Edenville, right, yeah, yeah Edenville, right, right. The, uh, um, also, I think one of the questions was how many dams are regulated by FERC. I think I saw a number of about 750 that are going to fall under this new process. Uh, yeah, I've got the actual numbers here. So um, they did a, a FERC, FERC, FERC did a presentation to USSD. Is that, so the total dams of their inter, in, inventory are 2,545. Yeah. Uh, low hazards are 1,506. Significant hazards are 206. And the real ones that we worry about are the high hazard dams, and that's 833. So you're not far off, Lee. Um, yeah, 700, 800, something in that range. Okay. I thought it was in the 2500 range. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another question from the audience. With the enlarged scope of the CAs, what is going to be your or your firm's approach to providing this service to your owner sl slash operator clients? I.e., are you going to develop the internal, internal teams, partner with other firms? How are you going to build this big team that we just talked about to identify P PFM for the projects? Uh, cut out weekends from our uh, from our personal time. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's a big problem. Uh, it's a big big problem. Uh, the the amount of work coming and facing the consultants is. Is going to be significant. FERC is aware of this, and they're rolling this program out slowly uh, to not overwhelm the consultants. But but we're going to have to scramble and and find people that can do all the work. This is a significant increase in the amount of work we're doing. Um, I don't know others yeah. have their own opinions. We're 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 investing in training. Um, there's a, there's training being offered by uh, USSD, the core. Um, uh, you know, and internally, um, and we're we're going to get people up to speed. Uh, we need to serve those clients, and we we will do so. Um, we've got we're going to get you know we have I should know I think on the order of ten to twelve ICs in the company, and um, and we want to bring our younger engineers along and train them. Uh, so we're going to invest in it and and have that capability to serve people. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to be a, a larger firm game, you know, to have the team. I mean, myself, I'm just a one person engineering firm. And uh, I obviously I could participate perhaps as a geotechnical uh, specialty person and uh, somebody else's um, board or whatever, whatever we want to call them. But uh, you know, that's uh, that's definitely not going to be an area that I can go after. And at 68 now, I'm trying to slow down anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> All 
there's certainly a proliferation of roles. There's the facilitator, there's the IC teams, there's the subject matter experts, the recorders. Uh, they, you know, all of this is going to be funded by owners who are trying to make money sometimes in a struggling market for hydro facilities. So that I, I think it, it, it's definitely a challenge for the owners. It's an opportunity for us to, for our younger engineers to get exposure to a lot of things. Um, and Shit. for si single practitioners, I, we're going to need help. Sometimes we're going to need facilitators uh, or we're going to be conflicted out and uh, we'll need help from other folks. So there's a, there are a lot of roles to fill in this process. Yeah, I, I, I think the key point is the profession or the industry in the United States, we're definitely um, don't have enough trained or experienced resources to handle the demand that looks to be in front of us, I think. So it's um, Certain, certainly the training and, and engaging our, our younger engineers is going to be critical, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it has a real, that's a good aspect of it is that it's going to be a good way to train people because, you know, you just need the IC or two ICs to kind of lead the thing and a facilitator. And then subject matter experts, you know, you don't, you don't need to have 10 years of experience. I mean, you got to have enough experience so you know what's going on as a geotechnical engineer or as a structural engineer but you know you don't have to meet the requirements of of what has been held up as we've gone along here for part 12 ICs okay here's a follow-up follow question from the uh, attendees between FERC starting a more rigorous dam safety program that we're obviously discussing and the new levy safety program instituted by the Corps of Engineers and FEMA. How does the industry keep up, keep enough talent to handle all of these upcoming requirements? And I think you've kind of hit on it, but if anybody wants to address the levy safety program. Or we need people like you, Tim, to encourage people <laughs> to go into civil engineering. <laughs> Now, if, if I can have a shameless plug here, I still teach the embankment dams class here at the University of Illinois. Started all right. I, I <laughs> continued by Skip Hendren, of course, and I know you know all of those people. So, so uh, I'm going to look at this from a market perspective. Um, it's it's a supply and demand, and and I think uh, I think the demand is going to obviously outstrip the supply, which which causes prices to rise. And so the response to that is is the civil engineers coming into the market or are, are, there's going to be a, just a, a tremendous competition for that talent and it's going to raise salaries. And if it raises salaries, it'll attract more people into the into the industry. So I, I, I honestly think that's the it's a, it's a market based solution is going to occur. And it's going to be more expensive for us all because the talent is going to be get fought over. Uh, I, I think that's the what's ultimately going to happen. Okay. So you're telling me I can't retire yet. <laughs> I, I, I'm, tell, I'm telling you to raise your fees, Craig. I'm telling you to charge you for per hour is what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> okay. Um, let, let's go back. I wanted to address those questions from the audience. But we were in the midst of talking about PFMAs, and, and Dave brought up the coupling of that to the risk assessment. So that is another new aspect of the FERC regulations that their a risk assessment is now being required. And the new regulations require a level two assessment in, in the process. So why don't we uh, talk about risk and maybe the differences in the levels? Why level two, for example, um, would be a, a good start. Uh, so who who wants to take off on that? And we're getting some audience questions array, around risks too. So that's why I wanted to get into this. So who wants to start on taking PFMs into risk and performing a level two? I'll take a, I'll take a shot at it, but this is <laughs> having said that, I, I probably uh, Dave is a better person to address it. The, the level two is sort of between the, the the lowest level of screening 
uh, risk assessment and the uh, the really quantified step by step full um, fully uh, fleshed out risk assessment. That seems about right. Uh, it allows you to go into depth uh, on the failure modes and consider uh, something other than just a surface look at uh, a failure mode, but it doesn't require the, the incredibly drawn out process of trying to go through every step in a failure process to get a, a full number on it. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's well said, Lee, and I think my sense and my experience is that the level two compels the owner to, again, invest in getting his or her, the organization's information assimilated and spending, you can generally get a level two perhaps uh, in a week or two, or two, so you can, that's a, a reasonable investment, I think, for a wide range of owners. So to, to sit down and discuss and establish the load cases that you want to evaluate and get a sense of is uh, hydrologic an issue? Is hydraulic structures an issue? Is uh, mechanical gates an issue or seepage and piping? So I think level two strikes me as the right level of effort to get uh, an initial problem set developed for that particular structure. And, and perhaps those that are deficient would rise up and you could shine a light on those in more detail, uh, perhaps in additional phases of work. So uh, to me, it's uh, it's reasonable, again, from an overall identification and problem solving logic that, that one goes through in, in our profession. Okay, here's a question from the audience on risk. Um, Thoughts on how FERC's intent with the new regulations to have scalable PFMA slash risk assessments. Will the new regs lead to significant cost increases for IC services? How will that affect smaller yes. owners? And, and Dell, I know you've got to go here soon. Um, so let's see if we can do this quick. Costs are going to go up. That's, I think that's the only, unfortunately, but for the owners, but yes, others? Yeah, I agree. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're putting the IC, a facilitator, subject matter experts, the owner's staff all in a room for a week, two weeks. Uh, whereas before, uh, frequently you had the IC and maybe another person um, doing all of that. Um, it, it, it's a big change in cost for the uh, owners. We're just the IC doing it. Yes, we're just the IC doing it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. A couple more quick questions here at the end. Do do you the new do the new dam safety regulations connecting with new financial assurance regulations as we move forward in this process? Any any thoughts about that? I am not well informed on the financial assurance stuff. Okay. Yeah, I... Another question. Does the new FERC requirement not require a pro quote project book that includes all design, inspection, and construction record? That seems like a large un undertaking by itself. And, and this gets maybe the Dave collecting the information that's, that's available and understanding it. It certainly is, can be, um, a costly endeavor to go down to the basements and to the file cabinets and try to find all these uh, historic information and documents. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah. But I would say it's it's if you are a responsible owner and you have dams or hydropower plants and you're the owner and operator of those that that should not be a, a long leap, I don't think, to be able to keep all that information organized. Today's technology with databases and being able to scan and things, it's, 
it's it's an investment, but uh, one that's justified and and well worth it in my experience. Hopefully, a lot of owners are well on the way to that. I know I've encouraged people when we put together an SDID. That's kind of the brief overview. But with that, there are CDs in the back that contain all of the reports scanned. So you go through the STID, you can see what's available. You go back to those scanned reports. And oftentimes, those are all the records. You know, that's it. You know, you're not going to find any more than that. So hopefully a lot of people will be kind of pretty close on that, I would think. But if you haven't and you've got a pretty rudimentary STID, then, you know, you're going to have to be scanning and adding supplemental CDs at the end of your document. Yeah. Yeah, the new regulations in Chapter 15 are, are specifically devoted to the supporting technical information document. And but that requirement for that document has been around. And like Craig said, hopefully owners have collected a lot of that information. Um, and now there's the uh, sort of the, the background document that you, they want to have beefed up in the new regulations and try to include as many things like construction photos and uh, old analyses, just a, a good historic record and backup for everything that's in there. So, right. Okay, well, that, that's all the time we have. I think we've gotten through all the questions. So thank you, Craig, Dave, Dell, and Lee for a great session and everyone that's listening. Our third panel is the owners. So all the comments about the owners and seeking new talent, bringing new talent and possibly increased costs, we'll hear from the owners next month on May 24th. Brad? Thanks to our panel. Thanks to Tim. You guys did a great job today. Thanks to our viewers. Really engaging discussion and thanks for submitting all your questions there and keeping things moving. As Tim mentioned, we will have a third part in this series with the damn owners next month, May 24th. It'll be 2 p.m. You can find more information about that on our Eventbrite page. Sign up for it. Get reminders. We would love to have you at that event as well. Again, if you liked what you saw today, click subscribe, click get notifications. We'll keep you updated every time we post something to our YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for answering the polls I put out there. And this was a lot of fun. And we hope we see everybody next time. Thanks, Craig, Dave, Thank Lee. You. Thank you, everyone. And Thank, you. Thank you. Enjoyed it.